preach all week. No, I have, I have four sermons, and, I, and, and <laughs> we'll just we'll see how, how this flows, because I feel like God is, actually, I have four this morning. I have three more for tonight, so uh, God is, I, I just feel so much stirring and so much excitement and so much uh, anticipation and, and expectation that, you, have you ever just got so excited you went to say something and your words didn't keep up with your brain and your brain is running faster than your mouth so it just sounds like you're stuttering everywhere but really it's just because you're so excited well that's kind of the way I have felt so let's start with this let's start with number one when Zach was doing offering he began to talk about that song that's an old song Savannah starts playing that the other day in the truck and I was like I said babe that song's older than I am and then she's like what (laughs) so encouraging Here's, here's what happens. There are songs that will have the anointing on them for a season. Now, there may, be a, there may be an anointed song that, yes, it's always anointed, but there is a season to where the anointing is so powerful on that song because it cries out. It aligns with the season that we are in. That song, that's where we are at. Take me past the outer courts. And I want to see your face. Take the cold, cleanse my lips, consecrate me, take me into the holy place. See, that's where that's the season that we have entered into now is is a season to where we are being moved past this outer court area and we are being moved into the holy of holies. We are into a season where God wants to pour out his glory on his people. That's good. See, the songs of the last couple years that have been so powerful, it is well. The noise is lifting off that song. Don't get upset with me. It's lifting off that song. It's still, it's still a good song, and it's still anointed. But the powerful impact of that is being lifted. What's that song about? It's about that even though everything is going wrong in my life, it is well. <laughs> Man, I've held on to that song. <laughs> I've gone down the road crying, oh, God, it is well. <laughs> Oceans. Oceans has been a powerful, powerful song over the last couple years. Guess what? The anointing's lifting off of it. What is Oceans about? The same thing. (laughs) The songs that have been so anointed over the last couple years have been songs about holding on during the most difficult times, even when nothing looks like it's turning right, and now all of a sudden the season has changed, and God is placing his anointing on the songs that are aligning to the season, which are what? About being in his glory. See, this is good news. You can get mad at me about the songs if you'd like, but it's good news. See, our heart was aligning with oceans, and it is well because we understood in our spirits it's a difficult season. It's hard, and we have to hold on during these hard times. But now our hearts are aligning with the season that says, God, I just want your glory. I just want your presence. I believe that what we're about to see is a move of God that will be marked by his glory. This, this, this church has always been, the church was founded for a purpose of what? God's glory. Hence the name, the upper room. I know that confuses some people. You tell them, you know, I go to the upper room or, or I'm the pastor of the upper room. Where'd y'all get that name? <laughs> we cast lots. <laughs> we took a poll. <laughs> the upper room, the very namesake is about being where? In the presence of God. You mean tell you where else the upper room was? The upper room was the room that, that the uh, Shunammite woman built for Elijah. The upper room, the name says, this is a place set apart just for the glory of God. Oh, how awesome is that? See, we've been fighting through a season of it is well, and I'm swimming in the ocean and <laughs> drowning in the ocean. <laughs> Throw me a life raft. (laughs) We've been in that season and and something has changed. We need to discern the season that we are in. Amen. So I want to discuss a couple prophetic words. And and really this morning and tonight, it's it's really just one long message with uh, several mini messages within the message. So, you know, you just take from it what you want. 
or what you need. But there has been several prophetic words that have been spoken in this church over the last 12 months, really of the last about 14 months. And I'm not going to highlight all those because I feel like the prophetic has been so active over the last year and a half. You ever notice that, that uh, if you watch a, a, a movie about like a military strategy, they'll talk about chatter, radio chatter. They know that something's about to happen based on radio chatter. Prophetically, it's the same way. When there is prophetic chatter, when the prophetic increases to the point that there's just constant prophetic words, constant prophecy, you know God's about to do something. It's in those, in, it's in those dry times and those hard times that the prophetic is hard to come by. There is not a, a great deal of prophetic voice in that hour, but the closer you get to a move of God, the more the prophetic chatter increases. And let me tell you, over the last few years, the prophetic chatter has been steadily increasing and over the last 12 months the prophetic chatter has just been a constant buzz why because God's about to do something God is doing something so last year I felt that we were doing really good I felt a lot of activity and movement in the church and I was excited about what I saw in the natural and in a year ago uh, in July oh it got rough <laughs> Warfare hit, situations hit, things got crazy. And it was like every week there was something new to deal with. I, I finally, I was about to change my, my title from pastor to crisis intervention manager. That would have worked. <laughs> or just crisis agent. <laughs> Maybe not manager, because that would denote or, or, or give the idea that I was actually managing some of those. It was like coming so fast, you couldn't manage them. You were just dealing with them. And around October, I began to fight some of the worst warfare I've ever fought in my life. And, and I, you know, at one point, I was like, God, you know, I, I could have been so many things, Lord. I'm at least average intelligence, you know. Why'd you call me to preach? Warfare was so intense. And in the middle of the most intense warfare, I get up to, to, to minister and, and I was closing service and the Lord speaks. The winds have shifted. The, the momentum has shifted. The winds are behind your back. I got so excited. So I declared there is a shift. The winds have shifted. The wind is behind our back. The momentum has shifted. I get a message together for the next week just to preach it, to declare it, because that's the word that the Lord spoke. And then it didn't feel like it shifted. <laughs> When God gives you a prophetic word, do you not expect it to happen immediately? So I'm like, oh, the winds have shifted. It's over. The warfare is broken. The next six months were even worse. <laughs> it is well. <laughs> Somewhere in my soul. <laughs> right? You know why y'all laughing at that? Because y'all were right there with me. Y'all got so excited to hear the word shift. After that, I think some of you, it didn't matter what I, what I declared. You're like, he ain't hear from God because ain't nothing shifted. <laughs> the only thing that shifted was it shifted the wrong direction. We done changed the wrong gear. I was, oh, I was excited. And then in January, every year, I seek the Lord about, about a prophetic word that... that for the, for the year that would define what, what the year is. And I'm seeking the Lord at the beginning of the year and, or, or at the end of last year. And the Lord uh, lays on my heart, this is going to be a year of open doors. And I'm like, yes. And I hear the word window of opportunity seize the moment. That's exciting. I'm thinking, I'm thinking by the end of the year, y'all going to be rich. See, seize the window of opportunity. Oh, is there going to be a spirit of Trump on the church? <laughs> Windows of opportunity. I've been waiting for that one. Last week, two weeks, two weeks ago, I was closing out service and, and uh, closing out worship. And I went to declare things are about to change. And the Lord re convicted me. He rebuked me. Don't say things are about to change. Recognize what I'm doing. Declare things have changed. So I stopped in the middle of that. I said, things 
And I stop and I just pray for a minute because the Lord's like, you know, giving me a, a, a very polite spanking at the moment. And then I declare things have changed. Things have changed. It's already started. It's already begun. And it was like the Lord was saying, you're not even seeing what I'm doing. You're taking for granted some of the small things that I'm doing. Don't despise these small things. I'm doing something. The process has already started. It has begun. Amen. That's good stuff. So let's jump back to the, to the open doors and windows of opportunity. I've been waiting for windows, for the, the, these windows of opportunity. Here's what I believe in my spirit. I believe that we are in a very unique season, a very unique window of opportunity for the prophetic, number one. If you desire to be used in the prophetic, now is a time to really cry out because it is like there is just this, this unique opportunity of grace to be used in the prophetic. That, that just blows me away. There is a unique window right now that we are, are, are under of an outpouring of the Lord. So I've been waiting for the sign because I, I think that we, we declare things. When we hear something prophetically, we declare them. There is a season of resistance where the enemy tries to fight that. And then we begin to see the signs of those things changing. And, and Zechariah 4.10 says, despise not the day of small beginnings. So when things begin to change, we have to stop and say, okay, this is not a small change. This is not a small thing. This is major because it is indicative of something major that is coming. So we don't need to overlook those things that are happening so we need to understand something uh, 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 about time there's two words in scripture for time in the Greek there's chronos and there's kairos I think that most of us know what this means but for the sake of uh, of, of uh, rehearsal we'll go over it again chronos is measurable time there are 365 days in a year there are 12 months in a year there are are 24 hours in a day, 60 minutes in an hour, 60 seconds in a minute. These are chronos measurements. Chronos is measured in minutes. Kairos is measured in moments. Kairos, by definition, is an opportunity. Let me give you the, the strongest definition of both. Chronos is a space of time. And Kairos is an occasion, a proper time, or an opportunity. See, there's a difference between Chronos and Kairos because Chronos is something that governs what we do as far as where we are at a certain time. We are all governed by Chronos because we have alarms that we fight with in the morning, unless you're one of those weird morning people. And if you're one of those, you don't fight with it. You welcome it for the rest of us. It is a battle every morning. Morning, we are waging war against Kronos. <laughs> like three of you that, like, yeah. I don't even know why Miss Bonds all laughs. She's up before the sun comes up. Her coffee is brewing before I could even smell coffee. But Kairos is a window of opportunity. See, Kronos says that we're going to start church at 11 o'clock in the morning or at least close by. And we're going to end. Okay, Kronos. Kronos really don't govern when we end. <laughs> Kairos is what happens in that time that we're there. Kronos says we're going to start at 11 o'clock, but Kairos is what happens in the worship. When we, when we leave out of our problems and we leave out of our, our, our issues and we just worship the Lord and all of a sudden we feel his peace come over us. That is Kairos. Kronos says that, that this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. But Kairos is when you go through a season like Yolanda was talking about in, in, uh, this morning uh, of a season of joy where God begins to pour out something different. See, that's Kairos. See, Kairos is something that happens. So I been waiting for the Kairos moment. We've been declaring over the last year that things have changed, things have shifted, things are going uh, in the right direction, all this kind of stuff, even though in the natural they're going just the opposite. If you haven't fought warfare in the last year, then, then, then you're excluded from this message. <laughs> or you're lying. So, <laughs> I've been waiting for this sign. And then we start raising money for our, our kids to go to the ramp. I felt in my heart that them going to the ramp was a divine appointment. I felt that this was purposed. I, I didn't feel that this was just a, a, a conference to go through. Because, you know, we can go to any kind of conference and get excited, right? 
You go to a, a business conference and they have a motivational speaker, they get all excited, and they come back the next week and they're ready to take their business to global heights because of this uh, uh, Dale Carnegie that they heard over the weekend. But you go to a church conference and a lot of people do the same thing. They bought the t-shirt, they're wearing the hat, and they get all excited and they come back and, and, the, and they'll do something that happened at the conference and uh, maybe it's a song that they sang or, or a, a motion with their hands or whatever it is. They'll do something because it's a sign of that conference because they're excited. That's not changed. That's just being excited. Excited. That's being pumped up, and that's great. We need to be pumped up. But there is a difference when you are, are excited about something and when you are transformed by God. Completely different. Our kids, yes, they came back excited. Yes, they'll do some of the, the dances and the skits and stuff. Matter of fact, I forgot. I was supposed to get with them. They were supposed to do one this morning, but I, that was my fault. <laughs> they'll do some of those things. And that's great. That's not what I'm excited about. I'm excited about the transformation that I see in our young people. Savannah called me. This was a setup. <laughs> Savannah called. Actually, she called her mother last Sunday morning. And she said, hey, can I talk to Daddy? 90% of the time, my name is Dad. 10% of the time, it's Daddy. She wanted to speak to daddy. <laughs> I take the phone and she says, hey, daddy. What do you want? <laughs> do you really have to preach tonight? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> it's bad when your own daughter says, do you have to preach? I said, not necessarily. Why? Well, we were just thinking. Maybe, maybe the youth could have the service tonight. I said, sure, that'd be great. And then, you know, then we had to go down to the logistics of who I was going to be speaking and, and how they were going to do this. And, and there was, a, there was a, a moment there that I was waiting on, on, uh, on my daughter to look at me and go, okay, okay, daddy. I'm going to need two Perrier's, room temperature, with some fresh fruit in my room. It didn't go there. I was worried. So, so, the, so we, we closed out worship and we set some chairs down here and they lined up and they began to tell their testimony. They began to share what the Lord had done with them at the conference. See, they weren't just excited. They were transformed. It was a Romans 12, 2 moment. They were transformed from the inside out. Our kids came back different kids. They were not the same. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were touched by God. And when they came back, they were altered. They were changed by what they experienced here. So we lined these chairs up and they shared their, their story. And, and within a few moments of them sharing, I knew that I needed to pray over them to release prophecy to them. And then I knew they needed to pray over some of our people here and I knew of just a few that, uh, specifically that they needed to pray for and, and, and it was just amazing I was, I was could barely sit in my seat I was fidgety because I knew what was about to happen I mean I was enjoying their testimony but I knew God was about to do something and I just I... you ever had somebody you just want to push along when, when we were doing television they would look at mom and dad and they'd do like that, you know, wrap, wrap it up. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm about to look at the kids. Like, God's about to do something. <laughs> I went to take the, the mic from Savannah. Savannah said, I'm fixing to do something. I said, no, you're not. I said, I'm changing gears. Really, it was God changing gears. I was just picking up on what he was doing. She said, so am I. I said, you're not the driver. <laughs> You know why there's not a steering wheel on the other side of the car? That's why. My mother says anything with two heads is a freak. Take that one to the bank. 
So, so, so I knew what God was about to do. So I stopped and I, I got them to stand up and I began to release prophecy to them and, and, and imparted that, that gifting from my mantle to them and then turned around and called people down to sit in the chairs and they began to lay hands on our people and I walked around. I saw our young people. I saw our youth weeping as they were taken into intercession. I don't mean weeping because of emotion. There is a difference between, uh, a difference between emotionalism and spiritualism. Emotionalism will get you all hyped up and that's great and you can shout and scream and, and kick somebody in the face and all that kind of great stuff and that's fine. But when the spirit moves on you, it's different. And I watched our children be moved into intercession. Their hearts touch the heart of God and they begin to intercede by the heart of God. I watched prophecy hit our young people and I could see the change. Intercession and prophecy are so different when you're praying for somebody. When you're interceding for somebody, when God moves you in intercession, when you're praying for somebody, you align with their heart. You feel their pain. You feel their hurt. And you feel the, the heart of God. And you pray for them. And it's so intense. But when prophecy hits you, there's an authority that comes over you. And it rests on you because that mantle is active. And you stop and you speak these words with authority and with passion. And it's like, this is what's happening. And then people can look at you like, well, that was just rude. No, it was authority. So I watched authority hit our young people. I hear it first. I'm walking by and I hear the voice change and I hear authority. And I turn around and look and I see one of, one of the young people and they're prophesying. Oh my goodness. <laughs> my mother looks at me and says, they're prophesying. I said, I know. <laughs> Joel chapter 2 says, the spirit of the Lord will fall on all flesh. The young men will dream dreams and the old, mission will, uh, old people will see. Old oh, people, oh, they're so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, the young will dream dreams and the old will see visions or vice versa. Ooh, that was so politically incorrect. The young people and the not as young people. I'm going to need y'all to form a circle around me when we leave. Y'all will be my entourage, my secret service, my protectors. See, what I saw was, was, was God moving on our young people and prophecy hit them. By the way, I've, got, I've gotten four phone calls this week. Not, with, not to say how good they are. I got a lot of phone calls to say how good it was and a lot of text and a lot of things like that. You know, the prophetic words confirm this and confirm that. And, and, and I mean, just really amazed at the accuracy of the prophetic word in our young people. And yes, I will get to my message. <laughs> But I had one person call me the other day and said, hey, I just want you to know that one of the kids prophesied over me. I was like, yeah, I know. I was standing there. I don't know what they said, but it, it was good. Yeah, but, but, but they had no way of knowing what I was facing and what I was dealing with. I said, well, okay. And they said, that person, that kid told me this. This is what I'm facing. This is a battle that I've been fighting for over a year. And there was, there was no end to this. There was no sign of it ending. Guess what? It ended this morning just like she said it would. I said, really? A couple days later, there was something we were praying for. That the kids laid, laid their hands on, on someone for a good report. Hey, just want you to know we got, a, we got an excellent report. Hey, there's this other battle we've been fighting for a while. And guess what? It came to a, to a head today because of uh, we heard the prophetic word Sunday and we claimed that prophetic word and it happened today. See, so many times we hear prophetic words and, and we hear the prophecies and, and then there's a season of waiting and we're like, God, what's happening? What's wrong? Why is it delayed? But then there's times when the window of opportunity is there. All of a sudden, the prophetic word happens and the victory happens. The prophetic word happens and the victory happens. We're seeing years worth of prophetic words begin to take shape right now. Matter of fact, I've been praying over these kids, uh, over our, our youth in this church, not, not to grow numerically. That's, that's a byproduct. But I've been praying for our youth to catch on fire. Look at, at 1 Kings chapter 17.
I've got several different messages this morning, but I, what I want you to get is the, is the points of them, and I want you to understand that we are in a, in a season where prophetic words are being fulfilled. As you turn to 1 Kings 17, let me give you kind of an a, a understanding of, of faith. I've been ministering on faith lately, and, and I, haven't left, I haven't left what I was, was talking about with the youth. Like I said, it's going to be about four different messages, but they're all cohesive. You just got, may have to put all the parts together at the end. Romans ten seventeen says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word, right? The word hearing is understanding. The word word is revelation. So faith comes by understanding revelation, right? Hebrews 11, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So faith is a substance. James 2, uh, 17, faith without works is dead. So if you really have faith, if you truly have faith, there's a, the word faith means conviction. I heard John Kilpatrick say the difference between belief and conviction is belief is something you hold on to and conviction is something that holds on to you. So if you really have faith, if you really have conviction, then it will move you to have, take action because faith without works is dead. And if you truly have faith and it moves you to action, then there will be a substance to your faith that people can see and the evidence of things not seen because of the way you are moved by circumstances or the way you move circumstances. But it starts... Because faith comes by understanding revelation. That means that revelation comes first. That means that the root of faith starts at having a revelation. You, I don't, I'm not talking about getting goofy with stuff. I'm talking about getting into, into the word of God and getting a hold of a scripture. That's revelation. And when you get that revelation in scripture and you get understanding of what it means and how to apply it, I don't mean because you heard some preacher give a one-liner and you hold on to that one-liner so you can make yourself feel better. I mean real understanding of how to apply this word, then faith is built on the revelation of what God's word says. Then you get into the spirit, you get into that third heaven or open to the third heaven revelation. And there are three heavens in case you, you didn't get that. Paul tells us that. There's a third heaven, which is the throne room of God. That's, that's heaven. There is the second heaven that Ephesians 6 talks about with rulers of darkness and principalities and powers of wickedness. And then there is the first heaven, which is our reality. So we get into prayer, we get into, uh, into the glory of God, and we receive a third heaven revelation. We receive a word from the Lord that comes from the third heaven, and then we pray as we pray and declare, we are getting into the second heaven, and we are making war in the heavenlies right here, and then the victory is manifested in the first heaven. There was a minister that told Mark a while back, she said, we've done so good at teaching people how to get in the spirit realm. Mark said, that's great. She said, no, they don't have enough foundation. They get up in the spirit realm and they wreak havoc and then they get, get their uh, uh, tails handed to them in the first heaven <laughs> because they don't know how to handle it. It is true. But revelation comes right there in the third heaven. Revelation comes in this book. So when we take scriptural understanding, a foundation uh, right here, and then we take a revelation that God gives us that aligns with what is in here, because God will never reveal something to you that does not align with his word, and then we declare it, then we get victory in the first heaven. So faith comes by understanding the revelation. So look at, keep, keep that in, 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 your, in your heart and in your mind, and let's look at Romans, uh, Romans. look at 1 Kings Chapter 17, I love Elijah. 1 Kings chapter 17 verse 1 says, Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Except by revelation. 
He said that there is about to be a drought on the land. See, Elijah did not have the power and authority in and of himself to declare drought, but God did. So God speaks the word to Elijah. That's a third heaven revelation. And he says, you go tell the king that there's about to be a drought on the land and the, and the drought will not stop until you, you release the words. And you can't release the words until I tell you the words. Think of it like one of these, these uh, crime movies. <laughs> Elijah says there is now drought. I declare drought. There will not be a drop of rain on this land until I say the word. So you can't harm me because I'm the only one that can say the word to release the drought. <laughs> You can't touch me, Ahab. Tell your evil wife that she can't touch me because I got to be the one to release the rain. It's just funny to me. I was just thinking about that in terms of warfare. I'm thinking, you know, that's what we need to tell Jezebel. So, so, so the word, the revelation. It stopped the rain. Look over in 1 Kings chapter 18. Turn right one page to verse 41. It says, And Elijah said to Ahab, Go up and eat and drink, for there's a sound of the rushing rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went to the top of the mountain Carmel, and he bowed himself down on the earth, and he put his face between his knees, and he said to his servant, Go up now and look toward the sea. And when he went up and looked toward the sea, there was nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And at the seventh time, he said, Behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, Go up and say to Ahab, Prepare your chari <coughs> chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. And in a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab Road and went to Jezreel, and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he gathered up his garment and ran before Ahab to the gate of Jezreel. So let's start with the very first thing there. He says, You go tell Ahab uh, uh, to go eat and drink because I what? Hear the rain coming. We have to understand the prophetic season that we are in and we have to feel the change that is coming before it changes. And when we are seeking the Lord, we feel something in our spirit and the natural does not line up with it, but there is something in our spirit, man, that says things are changing. I feel the barometric pressure changing. I feel winds blowing. I feel something shifting. I feel a cool breeze out of this summer air. I feel fall coming. In the spirit, we can feel it. So Elijah had not received the prophetic word to stop the drought. But what he did was he understood the season. What we have been feeling is in our spirits, we have been hearing the sound of rain coming. In our spirits, we have been feeling that there was a change and a shift that was about to happen. So Elijah sends his prophet out, or his servant, and says, you go look. And he comes back and he says, I don't see anything. He says, go back seven times. And on the seventh time he came back, and he said, all I see is this little cloud about, about uh, uh, the size of my hand. And Elijah did not go look. That's neat to me. Elijah already knew it was coming. He was bowing his face before the Lord. And he says, God, this is my, my thought. I feel the change. I know it's time. Give me the sign that it's coming. And then the servant says, I see this little cloud. Elijah doesn't have to say, prove it. I want to see it. Elijah says, great. You go tell, tell Ahab that he's got just a few minutes to get off this mountain before he's stuck. See, we, 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 we hear the Lord and we hear these prophetic words and then we feel the season change and what we're looking for is a small sign for the Lord to say, yes, this is changing. So when I saw our young people laying hands on our adults and prophesying over them and crying and praying in tongues, I saw that. That was a cloud. I don't have to look at a full church to see a cloud because guess what? You can have a full church and all of them are going to hell and it don't matter. You can have a coliseum full of a dead church and it does not matter. 
And you can give a good motivational three-point sermon and have everybody clapping and cheering and then going, uh, going to the bar afterwards to get drunk just to celebrate the good word that they heard at church. Right? What have you done? But when you see some kids crying in the presence of God with the glory of God on them and they are prophesying, guess what? You're looking at that and you're saying, I see Joel chapter 2. I see the Spirit of God moving in the upper room on the young and the old Acts chapter 2. I see something happening in the Spirit. This is my cloud and I declare rain is coming. Oh, that's good. See, we've been crying for revival and praying for revival. And then we hear prophetic words. And, and, and last week I spoke about the despondency in the church. And it's because we hear so many prophetic words and nothing happens. And we become despondent to it. Numb. Have you ever felt like the last thing I need right now is a prophetic word? Because I've heard so many that none of them have come about. I got the t-shirt and the hat. And a bumper sticker. No need to prophesy over me. It's not happening. <laughs> Hashtag too late. <laughs> Hashtag I missed it. <laughs> Hashtag second ride maybe. <laughs> right? It's because his prophetic words come and, and God gives us those words to encourage us. He gives us a word to tell us where we're going. I want to talk tonight about the delays. I don't want to get too much on the delays, but, but it is kind of like being on a flight. Right? You're on this airplane. The flight attendant comes over the, uh, over the intercom system. <clears throat> Thank you for flying Destiny Airlines. Your destiny awaits you. The prophetic word that you've been given is your destination. That's where we are headed. But unfortunately, there is bad weather ahead. <laughs> Due to inclement warfare, we will be facing great turbulence. There will be winds of frustration. <laughs> Pockets of financial difficulty. <laughs> signs of health issues. <laughs> Oh, there will be great bumps of relational problems. But don't worry if you grow not weary and well-doing and faint not. We will arrive at our destination. Thank you for flying Destiny Airlines. <laughs> Am I lying? <laughs> Maybe we should throw in some terrorist attacks and, and you know. Don't worry that it's Gabriel F-16 flying out by our wing because Jezebel is shooting ground-to-air missiles, but we will be okay. <laughs> but when we get a hold and we see that cloud the size of a man's hand, all of a sudden we see the runway. We're coming in for a landing. See, there's, when the Lord spoke to me the other day and said, don't declare things are about to change, you, you declare that it's already changed. You declare that things have already shifted. You declare that, that that three and a half year drought is over because the prophetic word has come forth to release what is in the natural. This is third heaven revelation that is being released into the second heaven to release the rains of the first heaven. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That's a, that's a Greek term. <laughs> Oh, see, we are, we are about to shift and we are about to change. Because it's, the change has already happened. The shift has already taken place. We need to shift. We need to shift our thinking. When we come into the church, don't look at empty chairs. And I, 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 I'm, I'm saying that to you and to me. <laughs> It's hard. Don't look at the empty chairs. Look at the fire in the chairs that are there. Right? Hebrews 1 7 says that I will make my flames my ministers. 
some translations invert that. I like it that way because I don't think that God necessarily makes his ministers his flames. I think he makes his flames his ministers. I don't think that he uh, uh, calls the qualified. I think that he qualifies the call. I think he looks at somebody that's on fire and says, "Ah, I've got a purpose for you, son. I think that he's looking at our young people and he's saying, oh, my goodness. I don't need but one. (laughs) I've got extras. Mm, That's good. We are at the brink of elevation. I think, I think, I think one thing that's, that's been taking place, and I'm, I'm getting close to being about to close. I think that we are, are seeing elevation. The Lord showed me two, two things over the last couple of weeks. He showed me the bin with shackles in them, right? And the bin with mantles. Well, guess what? Our kids receive new mantles. But I think God has been taking us through a season of building faith. He is growing our faith. How many of you have asked the Lord to give you great faith? <laughs> That's not the smartest thing to ask for, let me just tell you. <laughs> That's like asking for patience. Tribulation work is patience. So what, what happens when you ask God for patience? He puts you in situations that require patience. So when you ask for faith, faith is like a muscle. I love workout analogies because I can understand them well. When you want to grow a muscle, you have to put it under enough pressure that it tears the muscle. It causes micro tears along the muscle to open up and leave room for more muscle. Ain't that great? When you're working out, you're actually tearing something up on the inside. It's great. That's why you hurt when you're, when you're working out because it's not easy and it hurts. And then what happens? Then you're sore for the next couple of days because you're still tore up. But it leaves room for, for new muscle to grow. But there's another part of this. If you don't eat what you need to eat, there's no new muscle to grow because it doesn't have the nutrients to grow. You need protein to grow muscle. Do you know where protein is primarily found or the biggest source of protein? See, this is just God telling me that we should not be vegans. <laughs> that's not normal. Yeah, you can get protein from other sources, but not like you can from meat. You eat a good steak, that's like 80 grams of protein right there. Pork chops, 56. A grilled chicken salad, 30. See, that's why you need to be eating pork chops, not grilled chicken salads. I'm just telling you. Just my point. It is meat. What is the meat spiritually? It is the word. It is understanding. It is revelation. My dad used to say, I don't want to, uh, I'm tired of parting mustaches to insert the bottle. So what happens is God takes us through a season where our faith becomes strained and we are experiencing tears in our faith because it's making room for new growth. But we need to be taking in the right protein, the right meat in order to grow new muscle in our faith. And the next thing you know, our faith looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger. We are built in the spirit. There are some giants in this room in the spirit, right? My grandmother was a, a, she was a very intimidating looking lady. She was like, you know, almost five foot. Little bitty petite thing. Precious. In all aspect of the word, this lady had, had the sweetest spirit of anyone you'd meet. That's what you saw in the natural. <laughs> in the spirit... Oh, the devil saw this mighty woman warrior with this huge sword that would stare him down in the middle of the night. Because spiritually, she exercised. God has been exercising our faith. He has been growing our faith. We are stronger spiritually now than we've ever been. Not because of good things that have happened, but because of the hard seasons that we've been through. It caused us to work harder and to believe harder and to dig deeper. And yes, we are here now because of that. That's good. Savannah was talking about uh, uh, all the things that have happened 
over the weekend at the conference, and I said, babe, you don't understand. That's what I grew up in. I said, I'm glad you experienced the fire over there, but that's what I grew up in. That's what I still live in. And she looked at me and said, what? I said, that's why I, I, I go to the church and pray like I do. That, that, that's, why, that's when those things, I still feel God's presence just as strong today as I did then. It's still there. We don't see it moving the services like we used to. We're getting there. The season has been difficult, but guess what? God never took his presence away from us. He's still been there. But now we see a cloud. And we declare there is revival. Amen. If our ladies would come to, to the instruments, I'll give you the last point. Or the last message. <laughs> God is elevating us. Consecration always precedes elevation. Consecration always precedes elevation. God will always take you through a season of cleansing before he takes you through a season of promotion. God has taken us through a season of cleansing. You can see it before the children of Israel moved into the promised land, before they were about to cross the flood of Jordan. God told Joshua to take them through and consecrate them. Before they could come up on the mountain with Moses, God said, you better consecrate them. Before they could come into the Holy of Holies, they would cleanse themselves. That was the whole part of, of, of the, the outer courts there was a process of cleansing and consecration before they could come into the temple. See, God's been taking us through a season. This is the word that the Lord gave me about the shackles, and this is why I ministered on breaking the yokes, because the Lord is looking, he's saying, it's time, it's time, it's time. The time is now, it's time to do this. I've already started the process, but I need to get you set free of that baggage of the old season. I need to get you set free of those old cycles and those old hurts and those old offenses and those sins that so easily beset you that you've been dragging along with you because I can't take you where I'm going. I love uh, Jimmy Evans. Jimmy and Karen Evans have a, a marriage ministry, but he's a pastor of a, a small church out in Texas. I think there's only like, I don't know, ten or 15,000 people in it. And years ago, he was in marketing, and, and every morning he would get up and he would get his Bible, his cup of coffee, and his cigarettes. And he would go outside and he would sit down and, and he would drink a cup of coffee, light up a cigarette, and do a Bible study. And one day the Lord spoke to him and said, you need to quit that. And he said, well, God, is it going to send me to hell? And the Lord spoke to him and said, no, it's not going to send you to hell, but I'm taking you somewhere and you can't take those with you. See how good that is? I'm taking you somewhere, but you can't take that baggage with you. I'm taking you to a new place. I'm elevating you, but you can't take that old offense with you anymore. You can't take that old sin with you anymore. You can't take this with you. You got to be set free because I'm taking you somewhere. See, God wants to release new mantles to us. And I've watched. He has released new mantles to our youth. He's released a new mantle upon Pam. I see the new mantles on them. He wants to give us all a new mantle because we are outgrowing what we have been operating in. But first, we have to be cleansed, consecrated, free. Y'all stay in this morning.